I decided to download Tucker Carlson's interview with Matt Taibbi and listen to it as I exercised at the gym. It's a great discussion. There's a quote towards the end of their talk that I wanted to discuss. I think that Matt hit on the answer to his own question, in a sense, earlier in the discussion. I also think that it relates to the drama triangle. At 1 hour and 59 minutes and 20 seconds, Matt Taibbi asks, What's the angle on this? And says, There's got to be some end game that they're going for. And the only way to make sense of this is to give that up, I think, because there's something darker going on. Tucker agrees, saying yes. Matt continues, in the culture of the people who run this country, it's inaccessible if you're trying to assign motives to it. Tucker agrees again, right? Matt goes on, they could easily, like, just stick to the problem of Donald Trump. They could easily defeat Donald Trump as a political entity if they just, if they were thinking as political consultants did in the 90s or 80s, right? Like, make some subtle adjustments. They would throw a bone to the working people. And they would put forward a candidate who isn't, you know, physically dead, and they would win, right? But no, for them, I think it's kind of a principle that a certain kind of voter not have a say in things. End quote. Around 49 minutes, Tucker talks about how most U.S. citizens would think that there would be different standards of dealing with our own citizens than with foreigners. This is in response to the U.S. citizens Obama killed without giving them due process. The drama triangle consists of three roles. Victim, persecutor, and savior. If you can label someone as a persecutor in your mind, then you feel emboldened to retaliate. You feel like you can do anything to that person without it being immoral because you feel as if they deserve it. I don't know the moment it happened, but I think around that time frame, there was a switch in seeing citizens as the people the government was supposed to protect, and instead seeing some U.S. citizens as enemies or quote-unquote, persecutors of that government. My theory is that politicians started to view themselves as the government or law, rather than working for the people. So the president, perhaps starting with Obama, but feel free to comment with your opinions, may have started to identify as the government rather than as an elected official serving the people. Identifying as the government can make you feel like you are the quote-unquote savior or above others instead of seeing them as equals. Even if we think he was working for his donors and not the United States citizens, he was still out there playing savior for someone. And if you see other U.S. citizens, even if they're actual terrorists, as quote-unquote persecutors, you can get a sense in that position that they don't deserve due process. If you can scapegoat and say that no matter if someone is a U.S. citizen, if they're involved in terror, then you can erroneously believe that they don't deserve due process. That sort of thinking can lead you to also include U.S. citizens who haven't done anything actually terroristic at all if you just label having thoughts or wrong opinions as terror. Jade Helm Many right-wing truthers were upset about the Jade Helm exercises in 2015 and 2016, which were toward the end of Obama's last term. They noted that some of the exercise materials listed mostly red states as quote-unquote hostile in the exercise. They thought the U.S. military forces were trained to fight hypothetical Republicans in their own states. They knew it was a training exercise and not an actual fight or takeover about to happen. However, they really felt this major shift into viewing U.S. citizens as enemies, and that thought scared them. Just like with every conspiracy theory, the quote-unquote fact-checkers pick the most fringe, if not made-up, beliefs to knock down using the straw man fallacy. These people who were upset had a feeling that the government now viewed them as quote-unquote enemies of that same government, simply because they held different political beliefs. They felt as if the president, commander-in-chief, viewed them as terrorists for disagreeing with his policies. And, yes, some were afraid they'd be thrown into FEMA camps, just as Rachel Maddow was recently concerned about. But the Republicans during Jade Helm, who were concerned, had files showing that the government was treating their mostly red states as hostile in that exercise. At least they had some sort of quote-unquote proof for their concerns. Our democracy. We've all noted that the Democrats talk about our democracy a lot while wanting to end the freedoms that this constitutional republic was built upon, like the freedom of speech, freedom to assembly, like 
COVID lockdown mandates, freedom to bear arms, etc. At some point, I think the Democratic Party got it into their heads that their party is the government, and anyone in the Republican Party is an actual enemy of democracy, meaning an enemy of their party and their country as a whole. They don't view Republicans as citizens of their country in that sense. In September of 2022, Biden made a speech about how Donald Trump and MAGA Republicans represent an extremism and are a threat to the republic slash democracy. He used both terms. About half of the country voted for Donald Trump in the 2020 election, and many of them felt as if Biden called them all a threat. He tried to clarify that he simply meant election deniers, but that's still a large portion of U.S. citizens. I got the feeling while watching the speech that President Biden didn't think of me as a real citizen, but rather an extremist threat to democracy. I'm sure many other people felt the same way. To all of you listening or reading this, did you feel that way as well? When they talk about our democracy, especially Biden in that speech, I get the feeling that they see themselves as one country and don't view me or others, anyone not a Democrat basically, as actual members or citizens of their country. I felt like Biden was not my president while listening to it because he was giving this speech talking to people who didn't deny the election results, and he called anyone who did an extremist. It didn't sound like he was trying to talk to the so-called extremists to try to find our common beliefs and try to come together as a nation. He didn't want to listen to or talk with those sorts of people. I'm not someone who would yell, not my president, to someone because I thought he was not really elected by the people. I accepted that he was sworn in. However, his speech made it seem like he was really not trying to be the president of all the people in the United States. Most presidents like to try to talk to the whole nation and hit on the points they all agree on to unify. He never gave that impression. In all of his time as president, I've never felt like he wanted to be my president. I've only seen him as divisive. If there is another civil war, I think they'll trace the beginning back to the Democratic presidents who viewed their citizens as terrorists or extremists simply for opposing political viewpoints. Why won't they let go of the bone? Now I'll go back to the quote of Matt's from the beginning. Quote, they would throw a bone to working people and they would put forward a candidate who isn't, you know, physically dead and they would win, right? But no, for them, I think it's kind of a principle that a certain kind of voter not have a say in things, end quote. Another term both Matt and Tucker use in the discussion is messianic, which of course is another way to view the savior role in the drama triangle. When the Democrats view themselves as a savior, view and characterize their political opponents as persecutors, and identify as the government, they perceive their political opponents as being able to destroy their identity with an election win. If you take on the role of savior, you're doing that because you're attempting to get some emotional need met through a roundabout way. Saviors will have an identity crisis if they can't view themselves as saviors any longer because they don't know how to get that emotional need met in another form. An existential threat. If you identify with the savior role and identify with the government, such as denying mega Republicans or even citizens if they're really extremists, and then a mega Republican wins the presidency, then that certain kind of voter that you don't want to have a say will have a say, and the government as you believe it is will change so drastically that your version of the government will cease to exist, and then your identity ceases to exist. That is an existential threat. It can terrify them, and when you are afraid or pissed, your logical thinking goes out the window. That's why they're not thinking logically like political consultants did in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, they were not this afraid of losing their power or as pissed at their opposition as they seem to be now. And back then, they still believed their political rivals were U.S. citizens worthy of having their votes matter. Please let me know your thoughts on this. Thanks for listening and or reading. Feel free to share and give this a like if you liked it and leave a comment to share your thoughts on it. Have a great day.